often you hear stories and uh, songs and things about the most amazing fathers. And you ever stop to think about how that can be hard on children sometimes that don't maybe have the most amazing, awesome fathers? And even though some of us have decent fathers, hearing about the most awesome, amazing fathers can sometimes make us feel like we're uh, not so well off. Uh, Think of the story of the prodigal son and his super amazing generosity to his son that comes to him and says, hey, give me half the wealth, which to a father would be like saying, doesn't matter to me if you're alive or dead. Or in that Middle Eastern culture, it's as good as saying, I wish you were dead. And the father gives it to him. I wouldn't do that. But he gives it to him, generously gives it to his son. And what happens of that doesn't turn out good for the son. It turns out bad in a short-term picture, but in the long run, it kind of results in a repentance of a bad attitude. And then he comes home, and the super amazing father forgives him, even after he just squandered half that wealth. There are some children, adult children, who did not have that experience with their parents, and they never did heal of it. How about uh, the story of um, Dick Hoyt? Anybody remember him? Shared a sermon a few years back on a Father's Day. Dick Hoyt, amazing father, who, uh, for those of you who don't recall, he pushed and pulled and carried his son in hundreds of triathlons. Hundreds of triathlon. That's where you swim miles and run 26 miles and even Ironmans. And the reason he did it is because early on his son told him, I don't feel like I have cerebral palsy when I'm in the, in the race with you. This is a dad who went on to do hundreds of grueling races that I couldn't even handle by myself, much less carrying a full-grown son. There's him in the lower right-hand corner, probably getting some kind of award for being super father of the year or the decade. So children, even adult children with decent fathers can hear these super father stories and think, man, I've got a lousy father. Actually, fathers hear this and think, wow, I am a lousy father. (laughs) So today, I've got a father so bad that we can all feel good about the fathers we had or are or were. Ahaz, king of Judah, led his people farther away from the true God, even to the point where he sacrificed his own children in the fire. How do you feel about your father now? No matter how bad your father may have been, or even still is in your own eyes, he's not that bad. He wasn't that bad. Ahaz makes ordinary fathers seem like saints in comparison. Compared to Ahaz, even bad fathers aren't that bad. Sacrificing children was a common practice, actually, among the surrounding nations and tribes. What we associate with the worst satanic sort of ceremonies was actually practiced uh, commonly in the tribes around, though God wanted, uh, was very specific in Deuteronomy, no, that's an abomination. Don't do what they do in the land around you, or eventually you'll get kicked out. And so there, Ahaz was treading on dangerous, dangerous ground. 
But here's the thing. It didn't mean by those pagans practicing child sacrifice didn't mean that they didn't love their children. In fact, to the contrary, their gods wouldn't accept the sacrifice if what they sacrificed wasn't cherished. So, imagine to bring favor of the gods, they had to love the child they sacrificed supremely or it wouldn't be responded. So Ahaz didn't likely sacrifice his child because he didn't love him, but because he was deceived, deluded, because he believed a lie. He believed that sacrificing his son was a good thing. Wrap your head around that. He believed that sacrificing his son was a good thing. Despite the fact that Deuteronomy 12.31 strictly forbid it. The fact is, the Word of God didn't mean much to him. He didn't trust the Word of God. But he wanted to honor his kingdom by not withholding anything that he believed would result in their benefit. You see, the, the Syrians and northern Israel were going to bear down on the southern kingdom, on Judah. And they were going to get squashed. And his belief system, not being uh, specifically um, Israel belief in the true God, as we would expect the king of Israel to have, the king of Judah, he bought into a lie. So this story tells us something very important, that no matter how bad fathers may have treated us, it doesn't automatically mean that they didn't love us. Ahaz's actions were an outworking of his belief system. It's an extreme story, yes, but it's a principle that holds true across the board. His actions were an outworking of a belief system that he held. It was not, his actions were not about a lack of love for his son. You ever realize how many people, well, maybe because I'm a pastor, I hear about it a lot, but a lot of people carry a lot of baggage that limits their success in life and at the very least their emotional health all because they don't understand two very important things that we can find in this story of Ahaz. Number one, deception can rob us of important relationships. Clearly, he loved his child, but he was deceived into believing he was doing the right thing by sacrificing him. He was deceived, and it cost him a relationship. Again, this is an extreme, but the principle <clears throat> I find running rampant in humanity today. Decent fathers even, you know, maybe worked more than the child, missed out on baseball games, or weren't there for concerts, or, or you know, you can go through your list. Maybe you have your own in there. But deception can rob us of our most important relationships like father-son, father-daughter. People live their lives for years and years and at the very end of their life they're still blaming their relationship, their father, their mother for why they didn't live a good life. Ahaz sacrificed his children because he believed it was the right thing to do. The thing that seems obviously evil to us. But evil didn't look evil to him because he didn't define evil as God did in his word. How do we define evil? How do you define evil? 
By the word of the Lord. His word is a light to our feet, um, a lamp unto our path. How do we define, how do we discern light from darkness? <clears throat> the word of the Lord, but not Ahaz. <clears throat> so I do believe Ahaz loved his son, but believed he was serving his kingdom by giving up what he loved most. That is, I think he believed he was doing his job. Now, that should hit a little closer to home for some of us. I believed he thought he was doing a good job. He was the king of the kingdom, and he believed that sacrificing his son would bring benefits to his kingdom, that he would be doing a great job for his people. Unselfish, but deluded. Ghastly as that may seem, <clears throat> How many stories have we heard or experienced of fathers sacrificing their children for their careers? Not that they don't need to make money. I shouldn't include me in there. Not that we don't need to make money to have a food on the table, roof over the head. But how many have sacrificed their children for, the, for their job? Their example, passing down from their experience to the children that the Seventh-day Sabbath doesn't really matter. Because of their belief system, I'm thinking of one uh, woman right now who came into our church, loved the church, did special music regularly, a gifted musician. She was from that denomination where they don't believe in uh, instruments in, in the service, and so she was looking elsewhere and came to our church because she was a gifted musician, loved music, did great with it, went through all the studies. It came down to being baptized, and her father, who was a minister in that previous um, church, steered her away. And we believe, based on our study, that that's to also steer her away from being prepared for the kingdom that's coming, to be prepared for the trials that are coming, to be prepared for the mark of the beast, and so on and so forth. She could have, if she chose to be faithful to the word over her father, been the conduit for bringing him to the truth. But instead, after two years of attending our church, withdrew because of her father's belief and she wanted to honor her father. How many fathers sacrifice their children because of their erroneous belief system, dedicating themselves to their career past healthy, dedicating themselves to money? Uh, I think of Doug Batchelor's story. Anybody know that story? Father, he just, he just worked. That's what he did. Became a millionaire, maybe even a billionaire. But that's all he had. He sacrificed his relationship with his children to a large degree. Passing on his untruth. Um, can you think of examples of fathers training their children in lies that could be, I don't mean just mean religious ones, um, no doctrinal ones, but lies in one form or another. Training their children up, meaning well, but not amounting well. You know, prejudice doesn't come natural. It's taught. It's something that's taught to people by other people, and typically fathers. I think of Philip Yancey. How many of you know Philip Yancey? Know that name? Prolific Christian author, real sharp guy, raised in the Deep South, extremely prejudiced, taught to be prejudiced by his father, and after he writes the story about, about how as he became, began to really think about things, and he'd hear a speech from Martin Luther King, and he realized, I was raised to believe an untruth. And he broke that cycle, that chain of belief for the next generation. In my own situation, my grandfather 
a wasp, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant prejudice. You'd hear these these, uh, comments now and then that were clearly prejudiced comments, but my mother, thankfully, his daughter, broke that chain, that cycle, and we were brought up colorblind. Had she not done that, I don't know where I'd be because my grandfather was a big influence in my life. I would have inherited his lies, his deception, if not for my mother choosing to break that cycle. Look in, uh, or I'll put it up for you on the screen. Jeremiah 16, 19. O Lord, the Gentiles, mean the unbelievers in this context, come to you, this is a prophecy, from the ends of the earth and shall say, what? Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein is no profit. And the fact that they are coming to the believers those outside the church or those inside the church, indicates that they recognize the lies as lies. And the fact that they're coming to the believers in the truth indicates that they are choosing truth. Specifically, as in the day of their affliction. So here, people who don't have the truth come to the people who do And who do they blame for their lack of truth? Their fathers. And their fathers inherited lies from their fathers and so on. But this generation recognizes the unprofitable lies for what they are and determine to find truth. And they've come to the right place. Their fathers probably meant well, but weren't amounting well. They were not profiting in the way of true profit. They were not successful in the way of true success. So the number one lesson from Ahaz is deception can rob us of important relationships. Number two, bad dad behavior doesn't have to determine our destiny. You may have, may not have had a a father abusive, uh, abandon you, neglect you, whatever background you had, disappoint you repeatedly. You know, one story where a father repeatedly promised to be there and and pick up the daughter in a divorced marriage situation and would repeatedly not show up. What's the child to think? But I don't matter. So... Scripture shows us that just because you had a father who didn't follow God and his will, it doesn't mean that you have to follow him away from God. Ahaz led his people farther into apostasy, even sacrificing his own children in the fire. But one son made it through. Anybody know who that son was? Hezekiah. Anybody know about Hezekiah? Was he one who followed the Lord or didn't follow the Lord? Followed the Lord. He did not follow his father's footsteps. I'll read just a little bit from Scripture. Ahaz lived through not being sacrificed um, and chose to lead a great reformation. In Jerusalem, he removed the high places where they'd worshipped, broke down the pillars, cut down the sacred pole, Azurah, where they worshipped idols. He broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. Remember in the wilderness? Made a bronze serpent, held it up for people so that if they just looked at it, they wouldn't die from the poisonous snakes. Hezekiah breaks that. you got to be close to God to start doing stuff like that because as awesome as it was, the people started to worship it as though God, like an idol. That's how deluded the people had become. Does God want us to worship the church building? No. Yes, we want to raise money for a a, a roof, a, a new ceiling, 
I mean, I knew the shingles, all this stuff involved with the roof, but we're not bowing to the building. As good as the building is, as much as we care about the building, they were bowing to the bronze serpent. I might have, I might have had a good sermon about that. Don't do that. But I can't imagine smashing into bits. And God didn't strike him dead for that. He went on to lead Jerusalem into an amazing reformation where God did miracle after miracle for them. And it says, the faithful king Hezekiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord. That's what I want to have said of me, regardless of what my father did or didn't do. Do what is right in the sight of the Lord. You may be from a long list of abusers or abandoners or fathers who wanted to pass down prejudice or lust as though it's good or abuse of women as though they're second-class citizens or whatever thing it might be. But if we keep looking to the Word as a corrective, as a path for true success in life instead of being limited by our vision of our earthly fathers, we will find ourselves with true success. In Isaiah, uh oh, I don't know if I can get backwards. Yes, Isaiah 43, 26. Put me in remembrance. Let us please to plead together, declares the Lord. He's saying, you declare that you may be justified. Your first father sinned. Those I sent to teach you rebelled against me. What's this saying? This is God speaking through Isaiah on their side, saying, hey, let's, let's plead together. He's saying, let's plead on your behalf. You know, the Holy Spirit is a, a comforter. He comes alongside of us to work for us, with us, not just to give us whatever we want, but to be like God created us to be like in His image. So here He is speaking through Isaiah, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, saying, let's plead together. Let me even give you some words. Your first father sinned. Now that could be referring to Abraham because in context, you know, there's Abraham, the father of the Jews, the, the original Israel, not spiritual Israel necessarily, but your first father sinned. It could also mean Adam. Right? Adam sinned. So we end up with this fallen nature. And not only do we have a fallen nature that says, hey, be selfish, choose this. Yeah, look for the enemy and just be, hate them. Don't blame yourself for anything. It's all everybody else's fault. We can give in to the na that nature. Plus there's teachers. He even gives you those words. And your, your teachers rebelled against me, says the Lord. So in other words, I have t you had teachers. You had not only your Fallen nature, but you had a, a system, a, te a bunch of teachers that came up to you in my name and said, hey, wrong is right. Black is white. Deluding or attempting to further entrench us in delusion that would rob us of important relationships and even eternal life. So God's putting words in our mouth even. He's speaking in our behalf, saying, hey, let's plead together. I'm on your side. Your first father sinned and your teachers uh, sinned against me. In other words, you've been taught wrong things. And he goes on to say in, in, uh, later, but this is what the Lord says, he who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid. You don't have to carry on in your parents' wrong footsteps. Father, mother, grandfather, great-grandfather, somewhere in your ancestry. Do you know that both Ahaz and Hezekiah and Manasseh, Hezekiah's wicked so forth son, are all mentioned in Jesus' genealogy by Matthew? He could point to that ancestry. He could use them for an excuse. Hey, of course I gave in to all those temptations. Look who's in my ancestry. 
A father's actions don't have to determine yours. A father's actions, right or not doing the right thing, or outright doing the wrong thing, can be more about him and who he is than about you and who you are. You don't have to take it personal. It's just an outworking of who they are. They might have loved you the best they knew how, and it still turned out bad, but it doesn't have to determine destiny. Think of you know, a family in the neighborhood, divorced, kids, scattered. It's not a good situation. It's supposed to be like the ideal looking from the outside family until it just all fell apart and the kids seemed to be fending for themselves, the result of a divorce. Parents who believed that was the right thing to do. And I'm not judging whether it was or not for them. I'm just looking at the results of their belief. When you see a two-year-old running down the street in his diaper, it's uh, not a good sign. People end up falling prey to a destiny that they don't have to, and it's built on a lie that you don't matter, that your parents don't love you the best they knew how, but ultimately, we will fail if we don't look to our Heavenly Father as, as the corrective and His Word as the guide as, as to the way of life. Another name for Jesus was Everlasting Father in Isaiah. Because when you look at Jesus, He said, you see the Father. So in tune, His kindness, His love, His his wisdom, gentleness, reflected the Father's love. It's His Spirit. But yet some people have been raised with misperceptions through even Christian parents that, that God, through them, through a father more in particular, they picture what God is really like. And they have a vision of judgmental, critical, harsh, hurtful, abusive. You go on, fill in the blanks. Sacrificing one's own child in the fire is ghastly. But what about Abraham? You know, it took me a while for me to connect those dots, but the fact is, wasn't Abraham going to do that? Takes a little bit to, to understand, but Abraham was willing to do it, believing God had led him to do it. See, this is before Scripture was written out, and it was the plain written word. And I don't know uh, how what all went on in Abraham's mind, but I know that he was going to sacrifice his child in the fire. Well, he would have been deceased by the time the fire raged, but uh, which the heathens didn't do, the pagans. But the point being, yikes, did God the Father really want Abraham to sacrifice his child? Did he? He wanted his willingness to hand over what was most precious to him. He wanted him to be willing to. There's something that goes on in our minds when we literally, genuinely put God first, above our child, above even our firstborn son. That needed to happen in Abraham's mind. And that's why he's the father of faith, in a sense, because <clears throat> he did that. What a... And I hope, you know, none of us have to go through that deep of a trial in whatever manifestation. But in some sense, we all have to know where the Holy Spirit taps you and says, Hey, is that thing right there in the center of your life where I belong? Because if not, you will end up hurting 
that thing you love the most. You will end up limiting their future in some way, being, in this case, Isaac. Because God wouldn't be first. What's the great laws of love? Love God second with most of your heart, soul, and mind, right? Is that how it goes? No. Love God first. That means it's got to be God first because His principles are love. And from that flows a love for our children that is healthy and doesn't turn them into idols. And as children, even adult children, we have to come to understand that, that our parents were human beings, limited in human ways, and we can't expect them to be gods. And yet, that happens so often, that in some way we expect something more of our parents than they were able to give us, and we hold them to a standard that they couldn't live up to. But we don't have to take it personal if God's in the center of our lives. It's simply their limitation. And when we understand those things, it can bring us together. And then we can also accept the grace as we're parents, fathers, or mothers, as we're not perfect. You know, even Ellen White said, I know I'm not a perfect mother. So I think it's okay for us to be honest about our lack of perfect parenting, but give, us our, par- give our parents the grace of not being perfect. What about uh, the fact that, no, Abraham, you don't have to sacrifice your son. I just want you to be willing to, and as ghastly as what I asked you to be willing to do is, you don't have to, but I'm going to. One day, Jesus. One day, Father. If we look at the Father and Son in a way that is not of God's view, not in His sight, we can see a mean God, our Father in heaven that killed His Son, sacrificed Him, put Him up on a cross through ghastly, horrible, torturous misery. I don't know how close I want to get to that God. But that's what it took to save us. That's how committed He was to our fellowship with Him. That's what it took. You see, where Ahaz was deceived and amounted to evil toward his son and the kingdom, God's sacrifice amounted to good for his son who beheld the joy before him throughout eternity, not just here, but in the universe because of his willingness not only for his son, but for the kingdom. Undiluted. So here we are with that hope. Could you imagine the pain of a father sacrificing, allowing his dearly cherished son in a relational term to be sacrificed like that and hold yourself back from acting? What did the father put before his own desire, his own immediate impulse. What did he put? The good of the kingdom. That his law cannot be violated without consequence. And he took that consequence. I think in as hard as it was for Jesus to go through, it had to be even harder for the Father. Enoch Uh, said he knew God the Father better after having children. And I get a little glimpse of that myself. You know, bad things can happen to me, but ooh, when they happen to my son, I feel that much more. I think of his whole future and think, I don't want to do anything wrong that will limit his future from what God would have it be. So that's why I pray daily, regularly, God, help me not to act out of deception, but out of your spirit of truth. Worshippers of the Bible God are not perfect, 
But if honest with themselves, with ourselves, and we use the Bible as a corrective and not as a club, we will get better, fathers, mothers. Good gods, the good God, makes for better father. I found that myself. So in conclusion, Ahaz is a worst case scenario. But if we go on living out of our deceptions or lack of truth that we were raised with ourselves, we will be sacrificing our children's future in one way or another, to one degree or another. Most of us fall in between, uh, somewhere in between Ahaz and uh, Dick Hoyt and all that he did for his son, all that he may be still doing for his son. But the real point is that our heavenly father trumps our earthly father. No matter how good he is or was, God, the Heavenly Father, is far better. We can trust Him. We, no matter how we've been treated by our fathers, we don't have to live like victims of their failings as fathers. And we have the best Father in heaven. In closing, we can sing together if I'm Craig and Sharon and